The Menu is a film about a bonkers chef who decides to go out in flames, really. And everything in the design, every idea, every item, every palette within that building, we wanted to be created specifically to represent the vision of Chef Slowick, Ray Fine's character. And on that note, food. For him, food is like a religion. Where Slowick is in this film, he is the master, so he watches the kitchen prepare the food that he's created or designed. I didn't really know this world, so I needed people who did. If you're watching, your eyes are on everything. Everything. Yeah, I saw the chef's table about Dominique Crenn. I was completely taken with her and her whole vibe and spirit, and then Mark said, oh, she's going to design the food. So I was very excited about that. And then when you say fire, then they go food for OK. The philosophy of Slurik came from conversations with uh, Dominique Crenn, who eventually would come on board to design the menu for us. In this menu, Everyone's getting the same thing. Dominique Crenn is this extraordinary artist, literally one of the best chefs in the world. In fact, the first woman in America to win three Michelin stars. This is a part of making sure that everyone is on the same page. It was important to also get a sense of who he was as a chef. So his food tell a story of who he is. So he was trying to connect the food with also maybe a part of him. You respect them. You respect your cook. And you respect your cooks. I spend a day and a half with her where she talked more about the demeanor of the chef, the demeanor of the chef in the kitchen. We specifically wanted chefs, Slowix creations, to have an emotional coldness, to be beautiful but somewhat dead. So that enabled Dominique in, in creating the menu to not create a Dominique Crenn menu, but to create a chef slow menu to play the role. All those dishes that we have created is being challenging at times, but yet extremely interesting for me to take me away from what I'm doing every day, but to also create something that I've never created before. So I'm having fun here. This is my Willy Wonka, Juan Contreras. She brought with her Juan Contreras, her right-hand person and, and, and head sous chef, along with the local brilliant Savannah chef in Georgia, John Benhase, who are our advisors and our kind of key to authenticity. Dominique and her team have done such an incredible job of mapping out what most of the food is going to be. But then we need somebody to make sure everything that's happening actually looks like it's taking place in a restaurant staff for the kitchen. We recruited a team of people, all of whom had experience in kitchens, and we gave them roles according to their experience. In a well-run kitchen, everyone knows precisely their place, both in the hierarchy and the physical space, their, their station. I want plating in five! Yes, sir! The satirical element was obviously take that into an almost kind of militaristic zone, but we had to make sure that what they were doing at every moment throughout the film was authentic and actually correct. We had a few days in this warehouse in Savannah where John, our chef, and one of our assistant directors, Lauren Candela, were basically putting all the staff through a boot camp, literally, where for every scene it was, okay, scene one, you will be doing this at this point, what should we be doing now? Whatever we were cooking on the stoves or the grill or anything was always what the next course was. So it really did look like you were planning the night. And if you watched the movie, you just picked out scenes randomly, you would always know what the next course was. Because we were able to shoot the film almost entirely chronologically, that allowed us to stay with this internal logic of working through this evening over which the film takes place. M massively grateful to Lauren for choreographing all that so that everybody knew exactly what they were supposed to be doing for real at any one moment. Kendall Gensler was our food stylist. She and her team were extraordinary in actually prepping the food daily that was safe for consumption for everybody, that was delivered at the right time onto set so that it was still hot or steaming or whatever, or delivering that food in a way that gave us that high-end food look. Kendall is, you know, is one of the top food stylists in the industry, and we were so lucky to have her, and she, she worked tirelessly. The food stylist not only produce all of the dishes, but in this instance, we had to capture Dominique's dishes. They were submitted to us, but also you have to retrofit them so that they work within the confines of camera, lights, etc. We had Chloe Weaver come in and shoot some food for us, who was part of the chef's table. We even needed more after that. And David Gelb, the creator of Chef's Table, did a weekend in Adam McKay's offices. And some of my favorite shots in the film came from that weekend. And I really felt as we dropped these shots in that the balance 
of the film was just fundamentally right at that point. It was a huge moment for me. The actual eating of the cheeseburger, I have never held a cheeseburger that big before. I could not. I tried really hard. <laughs> I gave it a good go. I could not fit my whole mouth around it, but I tried. I tried really, really hard. <laughs> and it was delicious. It was lovely. We get from the, the earth to the table. I think being a part of it was just maybe a dream come true. Everybody was like really cool to work with and they got it. It's exciting. Food connect people and you can tell a story through it. Can I get the rest to go? One moment, please. Orthon is a well-nurtured small island where everything is run and controlled by chef. When you walk into Hawthorne, you see that everything has been chosen for a reason. The attention to detail is unparalleled. It's interesting because it's an experience, and all of us, other than Margot, really, are there for the experience of it. Food is theater. Food is comedy. Food is drama, food is satire, and the idea that you're pairing that experience with the structure of a film made perfect sense to me. Early on, Mark Mylod, our director, and I latched onto the idea that Slowick is inspired by a landscape. In a sort of biome of culinary ideas. Right, like it functions like an Epicurean salon. Mm, no, I like biome better, I think. Every step of the way that you're walking through nature, it's been twisted or pulled into specific geometric shapes that would never exist were it not for human interference. The paths are lined with four tons of white limestone that meets black mulch. These things don't occur naturally in nature. They're high contrast, they're brutal. They really exemplify a man who has become so fascistic over his vision of the dining experience that he has bended the environment to his will. We are but a frightened nanosecond. Nature is timeless. We want to make it really uniquely Slowik's vision. But on the other hand, we recognize this as an opportunity to reference some of the famous restaurants and chef's choices around the world. And the restaurant itself is a high-end modernistic glass front looking out over the sea, open kitchen, so as you eat, you can see the chefs at work. Plating in five. Yes, yes, chef! I love you all. We love you too, chef! Rafe and I spoke about his costume. It was an evolution from what real chefs wear into what this person was doing, what, what this chef was all about. We shouldn't have any indication on his chef's uniform that he's anything other than ordinary. It should be like priest or surgeon. We did away with any embellishments, any little vanity, insignia, anything. I told you who I am. I'm Julian Slowick, and I'm the chef here. Now, who are you? Margot is an enigma, and she's supposed to be. And I think something that I enjoy is I can see the parallels with acting. In a sense, what you see of Margot is what she wants you to see. This is what she's selling, and this is the character that she's selling. We didn't want a stereotypical portrayal of what people think an escort dresses or looks like. It's the balance of the products. You need the mouthfeel of the mignonette. Please don't say mouthfeel. Tyler, he's a foodie. He's very enthusiastic and loves food, thinks he knows a lot about it, has been kind of corresponding with Chef Slowick, and is almost a disciple of his, I would say. He's a fervent believer in everything he says. I really wanted him to look like he put a lot into this. His suit is custom made, this beautiful Italian wool. So he's put in time, effort, money. This is next level is badassery. It? To make this amazing for himself. Tyler, you cannot speak to me that way. Actually, I can, because ding dong, I'm the one who's paying, so maybe shut up and eat. Oh, oh my god. He's under all these delusions of who he is, and he's, he's a phony and a fake in many ways, and he gets proven to be that. Oh, my God. Elsa is a very enigmatic character. So once I put on the costume, it just changed my demeanor. You will eat less than you desire and more than you deserve. 
She is almost like the muscle behind Chef. No! She's not like any head of the house that we've ever met before. I really wanted her to stand out. It felt like I had a corset on. My shoes made me walk a certain way. My hair was pulled up so tight. I take care of the customers so that chef can take care of the menu. She maintains her composure under all circumstances. Stop! Following through on Chef Slowick's plan. Please hold still. All on set together. I think Mark Mylod has created a great atmosphere of an ensemble, a company, all enjoying each other's work and appreciating each other. I had this approach based on Robert Altman's approach, his kind of semi-improvisational approach and that looseness and everybody being in character all the time. Off to South Africa and talk about how racism is not so cool. I don't think you can go to South Africa with a DUI. I didn't come from a background of improv, and so I've learned it watching people who are really, really brilliant at it. You just never know where you're going to end up. <laughs> He's wonderful, especially at finding those moments of messiness. He makes it feel more like as if you are in a real dining room where people are really eating and there are different conversations happening at every table. I specifically shot the film so that any spontaneous moment was covered by two cameras so that we could take it as a whole and not have to manipulate it with other takes. Of course it's my fault, bro. I'm an asshole. We're pathetic, aren't we? Oh, oh my god, dude. Somebody shoot us. The nuances, the comedic nuances, and... Also the sadness. The, the sadness. Worst. It's so cool to watch someone just knock it out of the park yeah, and communicate yeah. the thing that you wanted communicated. All the actors have done that. We're eating the ocean. We're eating the ocean. Yeah. Satire is exposing human folly and vanity through humor. You'll be given a 45 second head start if they do catch. <laughs> okay. We can see the mirror that satire is holding up to our world. However, it also allows you to laugh at it. Oh, everyone dying was my pitch, actually. Super proud of it. Because you are allowed to laugh, the, the underlying messages can kind of be massaged in there a little bit easier so whereby at the end of this film people will sit there and, and be left with this feeling of they enjoyed it but also they'll be sitting there and wondering you know which of these crimes are they perhaps guilty of you failed and you've bored me and the worst part is i'm still fucking hungry The s'more. This very famous image of Grant Akat's de deconstructed dessert where they smash up the meringues and everything on the table and David Gell's work on Chef's Table would have done this beautiful image top shot down on the table and uh, I think that triggered an idea of, okay, what if the whole restaurant became, you know, the dessert table? Mark came to me um, about a month before the scene and said, I need you to start thinking about this, draw some images, see what comes up. And I began by drawing uh, on a, a huge canvas and transforming it into what this dessert might be. And from there, we had to figure out how to pull it off logistically. My idea was to set up a GoPro offset and to tape off the exact dimensions of our set with tables and chairs to match. So we started reverse engineering it. You represent the ruin of my art and my life. And now you get to be a part of it. And from that came the idea of the marshmallow straight jacket ponchos so that we would actually turn the diners themselves into human s'mores. We'd landed on this idea of the, the s'mores being this ironic final course before we all head into oblivion. So we'd sent off this new draft to Rafe, and he wanted more. The most offensive assault on the human palate ever contrived. I didn't know what the fuck a s'more was. I said to them, no one outside the US knows what a s'more is. So I riffed what I thought the chef might say about a s'more. It's everything wrong with us, and yet we associate it with innocence, with childhood. Why he would serve a s'more to his guests at the end, and the importance of fire and flame. Anyway, I was thrilled that the writers liked this suggestion and actually made it a lot better and brought their own expertise to it. Part of what I hope is my masterpiece. Rafe sent the basic thing that he wanted to say and then we just yeah. ran with it. It was, it was the right move.
I think it was owed to not only his character, but to the movie and also to the other diners in the room to have a send off for them. Amy Westcott, the costume designer, and her team created these ponchos, and then they all set about over a period of a couple of weeks frantically attaching literally thousands of real marshmallows. I think that people will watch the movie and think that, that these were fake, and they are <laughs> real and handmade. You couldn't move, and then you couldn't take them on and off, and then so you have to sit incredibly still. You know, so essentially you'd sit for a solid hour without moving at all. OK, if they're s'mores, we need graham cracker in there, which we knew we could have on the restaurant floor, but what about the chocolate? So we had this idea of creating these chocolate hats for the diners that we could then melt. Shooting the s'mores course has been uncomfortable, but also full of laughs, because there's never a good time to have, like, chocolate in your hair. The picture from above of what the whole room looks like when the s'mores are brought out and the pouring of the chocolate and the fact that we are wearing these marshmallow capes and all of a sudden we recognize that we are going to be placed in the fire. What transforms this fucking monstrosity is fire. <laughs> it was so surreal to know that my character was dying in this horrifically humiliating, <laughs> ridiculous setting. I was a human s'more. Purifying flame. It nourishes us, warms us, reinvents us, forges, and destroys us. We must embrace the flame. I do think that there is a cleansing element to fire. I love you all. We love you, and that's what Margot is witnessing. I think she's watching pretensions and people that had kind of lost the meaning of life a little bit. She's watching it cleanse. <laughs>